Franz Schubert was born in Vienna, Austria in 1797, at the end of the century of enlightenment and at the beginning of a new era of romanticism. His first music instruction was under his father's tutelage, but by age 11, Schubert caught the eye of Antonio Salieri and won a scholarship to study at the Imperial Seminary. By his teenage years, Schubert was writing respected compositions. This presentation will examine a later work of Schubert's, specifically his string quartet number no. 14 in D minor, also known as the Death in the Maiden Quartet. This presentation will discuss the three key exposition that Schubert employed in the first movement of the work. I chose to follow in the footsteps of scholars such as Susan McClary and Ruth Soli, who are feminist musicologists and have examined sonata form as a vehicle through which specific masculine and feminine gender roles are expressed. To my knowledge, no gendered analysis of a piece with a three key exposition has been previously attempted. Through my analysis, I argue that Schubert's use of a three key exposition lends even more evidence to the feminist critique of sonata form as a form with gendered semiotics. Let's dive into the analysis. I don't have time in this video to go into as much detail as I do in my paper, so I will be discussing only the major points of interest that I found in the exposition. First, a general overview of the exposition structure. The piece begins in D minor and presents the primary theme at the very beginning, with variations on this theme until measure 45, when transitional material begins in D minor and then modulates to F major, where we solidly land in measure 52. The secondary theme is introduced in measure 61 and is manipulated in various ways until closing material enters at measure 83 and lasts until measure 101. In the middle of the closing material, a new dominant of E is established at measure 89, and measures 90 through 101 are in the dominant A minor. However, we have a brief diversion from measures 102 to 114 to A major, followed by the final closing material from measure 114 to 140, with the ultimate modulation to the dominant A minor occurring on the downbeat of measure 134. There are two important main themes in the exposition that are central to my argument. The death motive is heard in the first four measures. The piece opens on a dramatic unison D dotted half note, played by all four instruments spanning two octaves with double stops in the violins and the viola. This creates an almost orchestral texture with an immense amount of power. The triplet, an integral rhythm in this movement, is introduced on the fourth beat of the first measure with descending lines in the second violin and viola that lead to a G minor chord on the first beat of measure two. The orchestral texture continues in measure three with a D chord outlined without the third and another descending triplet line that ends in what is on paper an ambiguous thirdless D with the minor four to minor one motion implied by the G minor chord and the extreme intensity of these measures, I argue that there is no aural doubt to even an untrained listener that the tonic is D minor. It is too early to confirm this tonic in the written music itself. However, it is not too early to define the death motive as masculine. Death is expressed fortissimo in a rigid, almost march-like feel with staccato triplets and descending lines that lead to the phrase ending on a strong downbeat. As we will see over the course of this paper, death wields the power to draw the ultimate boundaries for the harmonic landscape of this work. The maiden theme is the other important theme in the exposition. It sounds first from measure 61 to measure 70 in the second key area of F major. <laughs> The maiden theme operates as the secondary theme of this exposition, which in sonata form semiotics is the feminine theme. It follows the traditional characteristics of a secondary theme. It is graceful, pianissimo, and sweet sounding. When the maiden graces the music, the dotted 8th 16th rhythm is used in descending chromatic passages that flow easily and simply across the harmony here based on F and C7. The fact that the maiden's melody de descends rather than ascends is significant. The feminine theme has no chance to rise. It can only fall. 
The fall of the maiden is expressed several times over the remainder of the exposition. Her rhythmic motif of dotted eighth and sixteenth notes is manipulated into harmonically ambiguous forms and melodic lines that rise instead of fall. The triplet from the death motive is ubiquitously present when the maiden theme is manipulated. For example, let's take the section following the introduction of the maiden theme, measures 71 through 82. The rhythmic motive is the same, but the melodic line is now ascending rather than descending, and the chromaticism outlines ambiguity rather than stability. Just when the listener has settled into F major and the lyrical maiden theme, they are stripped away by a C diminished 7 chord tonicizing B, tonicizing B flat minor in beats 1 and 2 of measure 72, followed by an E diminished 7 chord in beats 3 and 4, tonicizing F minor in measure 73. Measures 74 to 75 outline an E flat 7 harmony with the return of an ascending rather than descending maiden motive, tricking us into expecting A flat major in measure 76. Instead, we crash again, this time into an E flat diminished 7 chord. Schubert sends us on this harmonic roller coaster again in measure 78, repeating the maiden's rhythmic motive an octave higher with the same E flat 7 harmony. This time, we end up on a C chord on the downbeat of measure 81, where Schubert sends us hopefully upwards with the maiden motive one last time before we come crashing down once more into the closing material that begins in measure 83. Another mangling of the maiden theme occurs in the introduction of a new theme in A major in the middle of the closing material. Here the maiden clings to life. This theme is even sweeter, and the first violin reaches gently into the stratosphere across the melody. But death is ever-present, this time in the triplet line carried by the viola. <laughs> One final manipulation of the maiden theme ensures her death. This occurs with an unexpected tonicization of the secondary key area, F major, from measure 114 to measure 124. The F major tonicization makes the violence against the maiden theme even greater. She has not yet been manipulated in her original key. But now the masculine ascending melody and the more forceful dynamics mangle the maiden in her home and her death is almost certain. <laughs> By the time the harmony shifts once more to G-sharp diminished 7 in measure 128, the original maiden theme is drowned entirely in the fury of the first violin and the viola that carries us to a definitive A minor chord on the downbeat of measure 134. We at last find ourselves firmly established in the dominant of D minor, A minor. From measures 134 to 140, there is only A minor harmony, and the first and second violin play the manipulated maiden theme is what I almost dare call the dead maiden theme. It is now leaping in ascendance, extremely rigid in rhythm, accented on strong downbeats, and has the dynamic marking sforzando on every downbeat from measure 134 to 137, followed by a crescendo that starts at sforzando over the last three measures. The final three measures pound any hope of the maiden's continued heartbeat into the ground with a huge minor one, major five, minor one, perfect authentic cadence across measures 139 to 140, punctuated by quarter rests that make the modulation to the dominant all the more final. <laughs> There 
are certain obvious arguments against my analysis of the masculine death and the feminine maiden themes present in the exposition of string quartet number 14. The main analytical argument is the idea that major keys represent the dominant masculine while minor keys represent the submissive feminine. If this is true, then surely my categorizations of male and female are backwards in my analysis, since the feminine maiden theme occurs in F major and the masculine death theme occurs in D minor. I argue that Schubert very deliberately used F major because in D minor this would be the major three chord. Then, in modulating to the dominant A minor at the end, the three key areas used in the exposition are D, F, and A, which spell an enormous overarching D minor chord. D minor, ergo the death theme, is ultimately masculine in the context of this piece due to its rhythmic and dynamic characteristics as well as blatant manipulation of the maiden theme. So, even though the maiden theme occurs in F major, it is still woven in subservience to the reigning D minor patriarchy. Any hints of the secondary theme that occur in A minor, and even in A major, are not the maiden theme in pure form. Rather, Schubert manipulates the maiden theme in these instances to show increasing subservience to the masculine over the course of the work. Through the use of a three-key exposition, Schubert entrenches a scarring male-female dichotomy deeper than any mere tonic-to-dominant sonata form exposition could dream of executing. Through this analysis, I have found that the three-key exposition does not change how a gendered reading of sonata form operates. 19th century romantic ideals of feminine and masculine were so polarized that their inscription into forms of culture such as music is not a far-fetched idea. In a society that viewed the feminine as distinctly other and thus a threat to the self, a composition by a male from said society would likely show the other neutralized by the prevailing masculine order. As a system of representation, sonata form is capable of producing differences that reinforce a polarization and hierarchization of gender identities. Schubert's extension of the sonata form exposition to include a third key area in his string quartet number 14 ultimately deepens the potential for such polarization to occur. It is important to properly historicize Schubert and this quartet, along with its inscriptions of masculine and feminine in the 19th century Romantic ideals. Many scholars have articulated the necessity of considering a specific point in history when considering the social construction of reality. Because this construction is indeed social, it is also constantly changing from generation to generation and from one side of the globe to another. Building a compositional reality from 1824 European society, as Schubert did in this quartet, meant inscribing a deep polarization of gender identities and gender roles. The sonata form was the perfect vehicle for this reality, and Schubert honed the form even further. His three-key exposition created a sonata form that reinforced the polarity of masculine and feminine to an unprecedented degree. For Schubert, this was reality expressed in music. And so, for Schubert, the maiden must die.